Well, let's continue on in uh, the lessons that I've been teaching on the doctrine of Jesus Christ, and that will fit right in to what Daniel has already said, because what Jesus Christ has done for us is what it opens the door for us to have this kind of relationship with him. We talked about it a little bit last time, and I want to pick up where I left off. We're talking about the significance of the death of Jesus Christ, what it means for us. We've talked about how it's an atone, uh, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And I want uh, to talk a little bit more today, read a lot of scriptures about it, and uh, discuss what does the death of Jesus Christ mean. It's more than just a good man who died, but it changes everything. It pays the price for our sins. We talked about how it's a redemption or a ransom. Jesus paid the price to buy us out of sin so that we could have a relationship with him in freedom and in truth. So I want to talk about that tonight. I'm going to pick up with freedom. When we uh, When we serve the Lord, We have freedom from sin and freedom from the law. Now, the law of Moses was good in itself. It told humans what they needed to do. But here was the problem with the law. It did not give them power to overcome. It showed what the law ended up doing was proving that God is righteous, proving that humans are sinners, proving that humans need a Savior. But the law itself did not provide the Savior The law, through its sacrificial system, pointed toward the Savior. When Jesus came, he paid the price. He became the sacrifice that the law was pointing to. So if we believe on him, we're not bound by the law. Of course, the moral teachings of the law are internalized. So we live a holy life, just as the law would have taught, but more so. But we are free from the ceremonies. We don't have to go through the rituals of the animal sacrifices every day. We don't have to go through all the things that the law prescribed. Why? Because Jesus paid the price for all time. So we're delivered from the law in order to serve Christ in the Spirit. And we're delivered from the life of sin. Now, as long as we're in this world, we still struggle with temptation and with the nature of sin that's within us. And that's why we must have the attitude of repentance every day. And if we find that we have sin, we must repent immediately. But the beautiful thing about it is the Lord has provided a way that we do not have to live in a sinful life. We do not have to be bound by sin. And because, uh, uh, we do not have to have the habits of sin dominating our lives. But whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Amen. And that's where I'm starting John 8, 34 through 36. And I'm going to read and quote a lot of scriptures tonight that we won't go into great detail, but at least I'm going to put it on the screen. And if you'd like to take a look with the scripture, you can. I'm reading from the New King James. And notice the last statement. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. So when Jesus died, he gave us freedom From what had bound us. We're free from the law of sin and death. You see sin leads inevitably to death. Well Jesus died paying the price for us. Thereby setting us free from the law of sin and death. In fact as we go on Romans 6. 6 through 7. Knowing this. That our old man. That's the old person. The old life. The person we used to be without Christ. The old man was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. So when Jesus died on the cross, our old life was crucified with him. The dominion of sin, the power of sin, the compulsion of sin, the lifestyle of sin was nailed to the cross that we should no longer be slaves of sin for he who has died has been freed from sin. So we're set free by the death of Jesus Christ. Romans six seventeen through 18. But God be thanked that though ye were, notice past tense, though ye were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. When he says slaves of righteousness, that's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. But what it's trying to indicate is just as you were totally given over to sin in your past, now you can be totally given over to righteousness in the present. Praise God. 
The difference is a slave of righteousness, a slavery is an adequate word, of course, but what he's trying to do is say is just as strong as sin had you bound, so just as strong you can have new life in Christ. The difference being you're not forced. Under sin, you are bound against your will, as it were. But under Christ, you're not against bound against your will, but you're set free to do the will of God. Amen. But his grace is even more powerful than the old life of sin. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We have the new life in the Spirit. Galatians 3.13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What that means is the law, if, if, you're, if you were a sinner, which we all were, the law pronounces the penalty of death. That's the curse of the law. But when Jesus died, he paid the price, thus delivering us from the curse. You see, the law was good in itself. But it could not deliver us. You know, if, if we were perfect, holy, sinless, the law would be great for us. But the only problem with the law is once you've transgressed, the law can't do anything to help you. All the law can do is punish you. But Jesus Christ offers another way for us. The Bible speaks of the death of Christ as a propitiation. And that's a big word meaning a sacrifice of atonement or a sacrifice that satisfies the requirements of God's law. You see, God always keeps his word. We sometimes think of forgiveness as just, oh, well, God just winks at us. He likes us, and if we can make him happy and get on his good side, then he can just pretend we didn't sin. Because that's sometimes what we humans think of as forgiveness. You know, if I can if I can make this person like me, then they'll forgive me. If I can bribe them, then they'll forgive me. You know, that's not the way it works. God doesn't play favorites, which is a wonderful thing. God is fair, which is a wonderful thing. Only there's a problem. If we're sinners, God's fairness means we get what we deserve. Punishment. And that's not a very good thing from our point of view as sinners. So here's the point. God cannot just pretend we didn't sin. God can't just ignore it. His holiness demands the price. And it's not as if God is just mean to us. But as I described in an earlier lesson, if you think about it, God is holy. He cannot have fellowship with sin. If we live in sin, then by our nature, we separate ourselves from God's holiness. So by God's very nature, he cannot have fellowship with us. If he withdraws from us, he's the source of life. What is the ultimate result? Separation from God means death. So death is not just an arbitrary rule that God said. Death is inherent in the very nature of God's holiness versus human sinfulness. And so by the way things are, by the way the world is constituted, our sin results in our separation from God, which results in our death. The separation from the source of life means death. If you cut off oxygen, you die. If you cut off yourself from God, spiritually speaking, you die. That's just the way it is. You know, oxygen is not being mean to us. That's just the way it works. And God is not being mean to us. That's just the way it works. You cut yourself off from him. That's your choice. You suffer the consequences. So here's the thing. God could not just ignore our sin. The price had to be paid. So it seemed like there's no way out. But what we could not do, God did for us. He said, I'll pay the price. I'll take it on myself. I will come in the flesh. I will lay down my sinless life and be a sacrifice of atonement that satisfies the requirements of God's own justice. So that this is the way that God could be just and merciful at the same time. His justice is satisfied because the price is paid. But his mercy is able to minister because now that the price is paid, God can reach out in mercy to us. You see, so the death of Christ enabled God to be just and merciful at the same time. And notice it's the work of God in Christ. 
Jesus is not some other deity trying to make a mean and angry God like us. But it's God's work himself. God was in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.19, reconciling the world unto himself. This is what God wanted to do. But he couldn't do it uh, uh, without paying the price. And so this is what's incredible. God himself paid the price for our sins. It's not as if just God found someone out there and say, I'll make you pay the price. It wouldn't work. God himself took on the penalty of our sins. Can you imagine the creator of the universe whose law we violated? He himself humbled himself and said, I will pay the price of my own sinful creation to make a way to restore fellowship with him. That's incredible to think about that. It's like the prophet Hosea, his wife went into adultery and prostitution and he went into the slave market and purchased her back and brought her back into his home and said, you're not a prostitute anymore. You're my wife once again. I forgive you. That's hard to imagine that we would say the husband just needs to throw her away. The husband, he just move on to something better. He shouldn't have to pay the consequences of her sin. She should bear her own sin. He should go on to a happy life. He should go Go find a new wife. But his love compelled him to take the penalty of her sin. He took the shame. He paid out cash. He did everything he could to pay for her sin. And that's how much God loves us. He can move on to some other planet, to some other race, to some new creation. But instead, he said, I love these people. And even though it costs me, even though I have to pay the price, that's what I'm willing to do. Amazing love. Amazing grace. Amen. Romans 3.25 Whom God, this is speaking of Christ, God set forth as a propitiation or a sacrifice of atonement by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Think of it this way. When Abraham was saved by faith, somebody could say, wait a minute. Nobody paid the price for Abraham's sin. God, you're not fair. You're playing around with your own law. You're violating your own word. But when Jesus died for the sins of the world, that proved that God had not violated his own word. But all the people of the Old Testament that he had saved by faith, they were saved looking forward to the time when God would pay the price. God proved his righteousness. All the people that he saved, and we look back to Calvary, were saved not just because God bent the rules or twisted the rules. No, God paid the price in full. Praise God. Praise God. And so we see, uh, let me give you a few more scriptures. Uh, John, 1 John 2, 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. He died for the whole world. We've got to accept the benefits. So what, what does this mean? A, a sacrifice of atonement means that uh, it allows God to act mercifully or forgivingly. It allows him to pardon sin without compromising his holiness and justice. It's the satisfaction of divine justice. As the Psalms talking about mercy and peace kissed each other, God's justice and God's holiness were reconciled with God's mercy and God's love. It might seem to be two contradictory impulses. Holiness and justice demands punishment for sin. Love and mercy wants to find a solution. Well, God reconciled those two qualities in himself. He is both holy and loving at the same time. He will not sacrifice his holiness. He will not sacrifice his love. Through the sacrifice of Calvary, he paid the price to reconcile the two. So it's an act of God himself based on his love for us. John 3.16, you know it well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Another term that's used is reconciliation. See, these are different words trying to describe the greatness of God's sacrifice. No one word could, could say it all. All the words together couldn't say it all. What the Bible is trying to do is paint us pictures, different pictures. So when we talk about redemption, that's the slave market. So if you think of it in the uh, New Testament times, when, when, it, when the scripture would say he redeemed us, 
by his blood. They could actually think of the time they walked by a slave market where somebody was calling out for the price of a slave. And they could think Jesus walked up. He laid down the money. Except it wasn't money. He gave his own blood. And he says, I'm buying this slave and I'm setting them free. They could see what Jesus really did for us. But then when you talk about propitiation, that is the language of the temple. And they could think of the time when they went to the temple priest and the priest took a lamb and slit its throat and the blood was shed uh, as an atonement for sins. And they could think Jesus shed his blood like a lamb led to the slaughter. He gave up his life to pay the price so they could see the slave court or the marketplace. They could see the temple. And now reconciliation is a more personal thing. Friendship, reconciliation of a relationship. God is our father. We are his children, but we, his children broke his law. We ran away from home, as it were. We spurned our father's love. But the Lord loved us so much that he found a way to restore the relationship. Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When Jesus died for us, what he was saying, I still love you, child, come back home. If you ever doubt that I really love you, I'm giving everything. I'm not just giving a little bit of money. I'm not just sending you a check. I'm not just wiring you some money. I am giving everything I have to show you I want you back home. I want to have a relationship with you. I'll give everything I have to restore the relationship. Amen. And so then you get the picture of, of a home and a family. The reconciliation that God has given to us. Second Corinthians 5, 18 through 19. I referred to this a little bit uh, more uh, a little bit a while ago. Therefore, as through one man's offering, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many shall be made righteous. And actually, that's uh, Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 18 through 19. Uh, okay, so we can see the reconciliation that God has provided to us through Christ. Everything we lost in Adam, we more than gain in Christ. When Adam and Eve sinned, that led the human race into sin. But Jesus Christ came to restore the relationship that we lost in the Garden of Eden and go from there. First Timothy 2 5, and this uh, speaks uh, of the, a mediator. When you think of uh, reconciliation, often you might think of a mediator. Who is the one that will bring parties back into relationship? Notice First Timothy 2 5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Now, the thing we need to understand, however, is that Jesus is not bringing us back into a relationship to somebody else. He's bringing back, back, us back into fellowship with God revealed in Christ. Because you notice it says the man, Christ Jesus. So you've got to focus on that. Again, think of the holy God, sinful humans. There is a gap. No one could bridge that gap. Now, a second person of the Godhead could not solve this problem. If you had two gods or three gods or two persons or three persons, each of them equal in holiness, if we are separated from the first person by our sin, then likewise we're separated from the second person by our sin. If we needed someone to bridge the gap between us and the first person, we would need someone to bridge the gap between us and the second person. The second person being just as holy and righteous as the first could not stoop down to be the mediator. If he could, why couldn't the first person stoop down? What I'm saying is it's a mistake to think of a second deity as performing the work. But the scripture itself gives us the key. It says the man, Christ Jesus, looking at Jesus according to the flesh. As I've been teaching, Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. We must keep in mind he's both at the same time. He's both God and man at the same time. Well, in his flesh, he is the mediator, the one who brings us back in relationship to himself. Think of it this way. In his own body, Jesus Christ united deity and humanity. Deity and humanity were separated in the Garden of Eden. But in Jesus 
Jesus Christ, deity and humanity were united. So that as a man, Jesus had perfect fellowship with the Spirit of God who dwelt in him. Therefore, if we believe on Jesus and obey his gospel, if we accept his sacrifice, we're united with him. But when we're united with Jesus, we're not just united with a man. We're united with God in Christ. So now we have fellowship with God again. It's not just having a natural friend. When Jesus is your friend, you now have fellowship with the Almighty God revealed in Christ. So the man Christ Jesus becomes the mediator between God and man. He becomes the meeting place where deity and humanity can join together. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. And the scripture tells us, whatever he ask in my name, I will do it, Jesus said. And so on. And throughout scripture, you see, we praise God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. What does that mean? We, it reminds us, when we pray, we don't really have access to the grace of God except through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So when we say, in the name of Jesus, that's a shorthand way of saying, God, I know I don't deserve anything of myself. But I'm pleading the blood of Jesus. I'm counting on the fact that Jesus died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. So now, God, when I pray to you, I'm not coming in my own authority. I'm not coming because I'm holier than everybody else. I'm not coming bragging all my good works that you have to answer my prayer because of my good works. But no, Lord, I'm coming because Jesus died for my sins. I'm Jesus paid the price. So I'm asking to, for, for your blessing and your help in the name of Jesus. Not my own name. Not my pastor's name. Not my church's name. Not my denomination's name. But I'm trusting in the blood that Jesus Christ shed at Calvary. I come in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. That's what it means that Jesus is our mediator. You know, we, in, in, in various religions, you go to priests so they will represent you to God. But here's the thing. We can all go to God for ourselves, and we can all go to God in intercessory prayer on behalf of one another. But as far as a mediator between God and man, we just simply come in the name of Jesus. That's why we don't pray to Mary. That's why we don't pray to the saints. We honor Mary as highly blessed and favored of God. We honor the heroes of the faith. But we don't go to them for prayer requests because there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So if you have a need, you go in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. What this also means, Jesus is our substitute. He took our place. There's a prophecy in Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. It says, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. First Peter 2, 24 who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And I think this healing encompasses both physical and spiritual. Every kind of healing you need, you find it because Jesus paid the price. His, the stripes were placed on his back. He was bruised for us. His body was broken for us. He died for us. He took our place. In Hebrews chapter 2 and uh, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. And I alluded to this earlier. We will die physically unless the rapture takes place first. So the fact that Jesus died on the cross did not eliminate the reality that we're going to die physically one day. But here's something more profound than physical death. First of all, that physical death is only temporary because we're waiting the resurrection. So that's one thing that Jesus has done. But even more than that, we will never go to the lake of fire. If we believe on Jesus and obey his gospel, we will never know what it's like to be in eternity without God. 
But Jesus on the cross cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what he tasted. He felt that bitterness of being separated from God, that bitterness that we will never have to feel if we will obey the gospel and walk by faith, we'll find that his taste of that eternal death will take the place of our own. What a wonderful message that he took our place. He became the sacrifice, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Just the last part. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. He bore our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, this doesn't mean that he was literally a sinner. We already studied in past lessons that Christ never sinned. But what this is saying, he became the offering for sin. He became the sacrifice for sin. God treated him as a sinner. On the cross, God punished him as if he were a sinner. The person who knew no sin took on the punishment of the sins of the world. And now you can maybe imagine a little bit more why he could cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If you would imagine. Now, all of us have sinned, but we know enough of the, the, the awfulness of sin. What if you are accused of being a child molester and you did not do it, but you were put in jail for the rest of your life for child molesting? What if you were accused of being a rapist or a murderer, a mass murderer, and you would feel that guilt and that punishment. And everywhere you turn, people would say, this is the person that committed these awful crimes. If you were ever released and you'd have to register as a sex offender, wherever you go, people would say, there's where the sex offender lives. Well, you, can, you can imagine, perhaps in a little extent, how you might feel if you were being accused everywhere. If everybody believed and knew that you were guilty. Think of how that would make you feel every day. That's how Jesus, who never sinned, felt on the cross as he was feeling for the first time the actual filthiness of sin placed in his innocent life. You and I know what it feels like to be, feel guilty when we've done wrong. But Jesus never did wrong. But he felt that same shame and guilt and punishment when he knew he didn't do it. Um, think about that. The one who knew no sin was made sin for us. Christ, Hebrews 9, 28, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time without sin, apart from sin, for salvation. So that's talking a little bit about what Christ's death means to us. Now, throughout history, there have been various other views some say he died an accidental death. He didn't intend to die. He was trying to set up a kingdom and they killed him. Others say he was a martyr for truth. You know, he, he gave his life in a noble cause. Uh, others say uh, the moral influence theory. By his life and his death, he showed what it means to be a, live a moral life to encourage us, to set a good example for us. Others speak of what's called the governmental theory, that God was showing how that uh, his Government is righteous and that sin will be punished and righteousness will be rewarded. And so he allowed Jesus to go through this experience. And the love of God theory is he wanted to show that he loved us so much that he gave his life for us. Well, most of these, all of these except for the accident theory, have some truth to them. But these are all inadequate by themselves. Because these all are in a human sense. They don't take into account the deity of Christ. In other words, any good person could live a life and be a martyr for truth. There's lots of people throughout history that we honor because they gave their life for their country or for, or for truth or freedom of religion or whatever. Same way, there's many people we could point to. They, they, they're a good example, a positive moral influence that, that informs us, encourages us to do right. And the governmental theory, showing God's justice, even the love of God theory, you know, someone could die for you. Give, you know, in, in a, a warfare, you'll occasionally have a soldier that will fall in a grenade and save the life of his comrades. Well, that's showing his love for them. But any human potentially could do that. But Jesus was more than just a noble person who died to show us nice things. He was actually God manifest in flesh, paying the price for our sins. And that's what's different. All these other human views of Christ's death, they don't take into account 
that he was the atonement. He was the sacrifice for our sins. In other words, without him, we have no way to be saved. These other theories uh, are, are based on the thought that the Lord, that Jesus is a good example to encourage us to do what we can do on our own to be saved. But the point is, we cannot save ourselves. Only the death of Christ could be the basis of our salvation. Now, let me move on. Christ died for the whole human race. He didn't play favorites. He didn't have a select group. John 1.29 speaks of him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The whole world. 1 Timothy 2.6, he was a ransom for all. 1 John 2.2, 2, the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. There's some that teach that God pre-selected those who would be saved and Jesus died only for the elect. It's called the limited atonement. It's part of the doctrine known as Calvinism, which is taught by traditional Presbyterian and Reformed churches. They believe that Christ did not literally die for the whole world, but only for those he had chosen in advance by individual predestination to be saved. That's a false doctrine. You see the scriptures that refute it directly right here. He really died for every person. I don't have to go up to somebody and witnessing to them thinking, I wonder if they're one of the elect. Because if they aren't, Christ didn't die for them. There's no use even me talking to them because they could not be saved if they wanted to. Of course, by definition, they would never want to. Or do I think they're one of the elect? So I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and talk to them. Well, there's really no need to talk to them then either because if they're one of the elect, they're going to be saved no matter what, sooner or later, somehow or the other. So really, I don't have to talk to either one of them. That's an erroneous doctrine. He died for each individual. I quoted some of this before, but Hebrews 2.9, he tasted death for every one individually and for sinners. So if you don't think you're a sinner, you might think that Christ didn't die for you. But if you think you're a sinner, then you know he did. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can anything be more clear and plain than that? Of course, here's the point. The benefits come only to those who believe and obey the gospel. Some might say, well, if he died for the whole world, does that mean the whole world is going to be saved in the end? Well, here's the problem. You must personally accept his gospel. It's only effective to those who receive it. God gave freedom of choice in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. He has never taken away that freedom of choice. So he's not going to force anyone to serve him. He's not going to force anyone to accept his gospel. So while he died for everyone, his death is only effective for those who accept it. You know, that would be like someone dying and leaving, uh, you know, multi-million dollar uh, in their will, a trust fund for everybody who lives in the city of Austin. Well, the money might be in the bank, but until you personally go claim your share, you do not have the benefits. So if you don't know about it or you don't bother to go through the procedure, even though it's left for you, you will never receive it unless you act upon that gift. So it is with the sacrifice of Christ. It's for the whole world, but not everybody obeys. For by grace you have been saved through faith. You've got to receive it by faith. Of course, that's another lesson. Uh, Hebrews 5, 9, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. You must believe him to the point of obeying his gospel. If you don't obey him, you will never receive the benefits. So he died for the church. And that's why some passages say he died for the church. Because while he died for the whole world, it only applies to those who receive it, which become the church. And so the scriptures say in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, it says that uh, husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So he gave himself for the church. Here's the thing. The church is not a pre-selected group. But the church is whosoever will. If you want the benefits that belong to the church, you need to come into the church. 
And when I say join the church, I don't mean sign a card. I mean you must be born again to become part of the church. So the church is not a restricted group pre-selected by God. The church is open to whosoever will. If you want the blessings that the scripture promises for the church, you've got to get in the church. The church is going up. If you want to go up, get in the church and stay in it. Praise God. Church is not perfect. You might say, well, there's a lot of hypocrites. I don't want to go to church as all the hypocrites. Well, that means they're closer to God than you are. If they're standing in between you and God, they're closer to God than you are. That's a bad excuse. That's like saying, you know, I need to go to New York City. My flight leaves in an hour. But, you know, I don't like the looks of that guy sitting on there. I, I, you know, he smokes and, uh, uh, and I, you know, this guy's not dressed right. And so, hey, I don't want to get on the plane with people like that. I refuse to get on the plane. Well, guess what? Those guys will get to New York and you'll be just still standing here. Don't argue about the other passengers. If you want to get to the destination, get in the airplane. Get in the church. The church is going up. Let God figure out who else is going to make it. But if you want to make it, get in the church and stay in and keep moving forward. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, he wants everyone to be part of the church. 1 Timothy 2.4 Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That doesn't sound like he died just for a select few. His desire is for everyone to come into the church. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Here's the thing. If you're in the church, he knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations. And I think I'm going to stop right here because here's my point. He wants everyone to be saved. He wants everyone to come to the knowledge of truth. Once you come to the truth, you will have temptations, tests, and trials. But think of it this way. He knows how to deliver you. Once you're in the church, do not say, I can't make it. Do not say, the trial's too hard for me. Do not say, the temptation is too great. Do not say, there are too many sinners and hypocrites in the church. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly. The Lord knows how to bring you out. The Lord knows how to bring you through. If you want to be saved, you can be saved. If you'll believe on Jesus, you can make it. I don't care what happens. You can make it because the Lord promised that to us. Amen. In fact, uh, back in Romans 5, I touched on it briefly. It says, it said that if he died for us while we were sinners, if he committed his love toward us while we were enemies, how much more shall we be saved by his life? In other words, if Jesus paid the maximum price when we were his enemies, Do you think he's going to let us down now that we're his friends? Now that we're the bride of Christ? You think he'd just say, I don't have any more love left. I gave it all up front. I don't have any men. No. No. You men, you understand. If you see a woman you really like and you want to marry her, you start wooing her. Maybe she doesn't even love you yet, but you start acting in that loving way. Well, after you get her, it would be foolish to drop her and say, okay, let's go on to the next one. You spent all that time in love to get the one you wanted. Now you treasure and love her. That's what the Lord's going to do with the church. When we were his enemies, he died for us. And so he will do whatever it takes to keep us in his grace, in his love. He won't force us. It's always up to us to keep walking by faith. I'll read this. It's not on in the notes, but Romans 8.32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God gave the life of his own son, in order to win us. If God gave his human life in order to save us, is he going to give up on us now? Now that we belong to him? Is he going to bring you halfway across the river and let you drown now? No. He's going to bring you the rest of the way. If he paid the maximum price up front, he will give you whatever else you need to make it. Let's stand right now. Praise God. The love of God is rich and powerful and strong. The devil will tell you you don't deserve it. The devil will tell you failed. But like 
as Daniel said, there is the path of repentance. And you just turn it back on the devil and say, look, I know I'm not worthy. You don't have to convince me of that. But if Jesus didn't want to save me, he would have never started with me. There was a time I fought against him. There was a time I rejected him. There was a time I cursed him. There was a time I was his enemy. If he loved me then, if he gave his life then, if he shed his blood then, you can't convince me that he doesn't love me now. If I fail now, I'll go to him and repent. He will forgive me because he loves me. I'm not listening to this stuff that I'm not worthy. God's tired of me. God won't forgive me. God doesn't care about me. God won't give me grace. No, he did all of that when I hated him. He did all of that when I was his enemy. I know he'll do it now that I'm his friend. I know he'll do it now that I'm his bride. I know I'll do it now that I'm part of the family of God. So I refuse to listen to negativity, fear, and doubt. I refuse to listen to discouragement and depression I choose to hear the message of love and mercy and grace the Lord will see me through the Lord will give me victory the Lord will lift me up the Lord will lift me out the Lord will bring me on my way hallelujah oh yes praise God praise God praise God we ought to worship him hallelujah praise God there's anybody you'd like to come. I know many people have been attacked by various things, the things of this world. If you'd like to come and pray, if you'd like to stand around here at the altar or kneel, we'll be glad to pray with you. If you need personal victory in your life, don't leave without talking to the Lord. So I invite you, sing a little something or play a little something, and let's rejoice in the victory that God is giving us. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Come and pray. If you'd like to come and pray, just come on right now. Hallelujah. Come and seek the Lord. We'll be happy to pray with you. Some, why don't you come and join us and help us bind together in faith and prayer. Amen. Yes. Praise God. Praise God. When I think about the goodness of the Lord. And I think about the Lord, how He saved.